Yeah, the ultimate goal of Bitcoin, I would say. One group of people is mostly interested in the anonymous futures of it. Yeah. And But then there was also this group of people that were more the monetary reformers. So they were interested in creating a better form of money. This yeah. idea is, to a very large extent, uh, come from Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian economist. And he believed that money should be left to the free market. Welcome to the Cashflow Academy podcast. I'm Andy Tanner. This is where we do our very, very best to make investing simple. And I am just thrilled uh, with our guests. We're going to be talking about uh, 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 Bitcoin. And his name is Aaron Van Weerdem. And he has written a book called The Genesis Book, The Story of the People and Projects that Expired Bitcoin. It's a really hot topic, especially since uh, cryptos have surged recently. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'll, I'll give a little plug for, uh, for our website that, that we've put up this new. It's called yourinvestingclass.com, so go check that out. We always have fun goodies there. Uh, great education. And uh, I'm going to set the context before I introduce Aaron formally. Bitcoin has been a fascinating thing for someone like me who's a, you know, primarily a stock investor. I have some real estate, I have some business. And, uh, you know, I think it's really important, and this is just an opinion. Whenever I say I think, this is not a fact, this is just an opinion. You, you guys can decide it's a fact or not. But one of the, you know, when, when I have this investing brain that's limited and imperfect, I still tend to superimpose it onto every asset class. And one of the things I will tell you and the reason I'm so excited to have uh, Aaron with us and to recommend his book is I think success is often a function of the investor rather than the investment. And so when people begin to talk about oil, uh, there's dogmatism. You know, oil's the best thing. Or people talk about real estate. Real estate's the best thing. But when people ask me, you know, should I invest in gold? My question is, what do you know about gold? And when people say, should I invest in stocks? I go, well, what do you know about stocks? And when people say, should I invest in cryptocurrency, I always say, what do you know about cryptocurrency? Because when I look at a guy like Warren Buffett, I don't think the, the, he, you know, the stock market was the function of his success. I think Buffett. And if you find um, success in whatever asset class you decide, be it cryptocurrency, I think you'll often say, gee, you know, my success was a function of my personal development and skill in that asset class. So with that context, you have a, an amazing opportunity to purchase a unique book. There's lots of books about currency and cryptocurrency, but this one deals very much with history and context and story and narrative. Uh, I think it's a beautiful opportunity for you uh, with your education. So uh, with that, uh, you know, I usually try to be a little bit more terse with my introductions, but with that long-winded uh, but important introduction, Aaron uh, Van Weerdem, thank you for joining us. Excited to speak. Your background, uh, you, you've, you got involved, yes, uh, maybe even go back before that. I mean, you were a journalist, uh, Bitcoin Magazine, you became a technical editor. Uh, you started on the journalism side of learning about this, this, but tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to, uh, to write the book. Background is I've been writing about Bitcoin for 10 years and throughout uh, these years I became, I sort of morphed into the technical editor of Bitcoin magazine in the Bitcoin world. I don't know if you know about this. We had a very tense debate for a while called the block size wars is what people yes. sometimes call it. And I was covering that a lot. And at some point in early 2018, this was kind of over. And for me, this was a moment that I felt I wanted to zoom out. And like this debate was really about the future of Bitcoin and there were these weekly developments and I thought, all right, I'm going to do the opposite thing now. I'm going to research and explore where all of this came from. So you gave a very nice intro about understanding asset classes. And I think Bitcoin is a very, it's a very relevant intro for, for Bitcoin in particular. A lot of people still think there's this sort of common idea, perception, myth, I would call it that Bitcoin came out of nothing. There was, no, there was nothing, and then Satoshi Nakamoto descended from the heavens or you know, whoever he was. <laughs> whoever he is. Yes, and he created this technology out of nothing. And I, I really don't think that is the case. So in my book, I explore the, the prehistory 
to your Bitcoin essentially. And what you find if you do that is that Bitcoin uh, was really, I would argue, the end result of many iterative steps of both technological development and uh, thinking about monetary economics. And sort of throughout my book, you explore, you know, sort of one step at a time, how these people that were trying to think about these types of things and trying to reinvent money, which is a very radical idea, of course, and how they eventually came to Bitcoin. So that's but, that's the book in a nutshell. And I, I do believe that's a good way of understanding Bitcoin itself. If you want to understand something, it's important to know where it came from, where did, where did these ideas emerge from and how did it all come together? I, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm, uh, I just finished a, a second edition of my book on 401ks and understand and your book is wonderfully titled, by the way, the Genesis book. It's, it couldn't be a better title because understanding the Genesis of anything is understanding the, the prehistory, the history. And it's usually not just uh, informative. It's usually wildly entertaining, I guess, depending on who you are. I, I find stuff like it's fascinating. I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin for a different reason than most people would think. I think it's it's been an incredible gateway drug for so many people into financial education they never would have had otherwise. Uh, they hear about this thing and it's popular or it's a movement or it's anti-establishment or whatever. You know, it's political. It's got all this, this different types of horsepower and energy in it. And people say, well, maybe some people say I should learn about this. And as a result, they have to get smarter about being an investor. And they learn the difference between capital gain type of ventures and cash flow ventures. Uh, the idea of a store of wealth uh, versus a medium exchange. Uh, the idea of what a commodity is versus what a business would be. And so uh, I, I, I love it. Let's hop in here. You know, my my producers are awesome. They they always give me great questions. You know that they recommend I ask, and I go rogue about a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> so the first question I'd like to throw at you is um, about dogmatism. And what I mean by dogmatism is when someone just declares something as being true. And it, it almost becomes, there's almost a, religio, a religious, religi, religiosity, religiousness to it, mm -hmm. I guess is the word I'm looking for, to where, like, I'll talk to an oil guy, and I'll know immediately whether the guy understands oil or not, by the, to the degree he can poke holes in oil. In other words, you know, gold has flaws in it, but gold guys can't say that. For example, uh, well, I can't eat gold. And I certainly can't fuel my car with gold. And gold's value, I can make a watch with it. I can make a, a, a ring with it. But if people have confidence in its currency or in its value in terms of money, like a, it's fungible, uh, as is, as, you know, it's dividable, uh, as Bitcoin is. One is an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold. So when a person can tell me the ups and downs, like I'm a stock guy, and I will tell people, look, before you invest in stocks, there's massive risks to learn about. So, you know, how do you feel about Bitcoin that way? Is many times when I talk about there's 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 a loss of pragmatism and a dogmatism, like this is it, this is flawless, this is the perfect. We finally achieved the the Titanic that's unsinkable. Uh, this is the one. Could you talk to me and address what you see? in terms of, uh, of, of, do you see that in Bitcoin like I do or, or no? Um, culturally speaking, I, I do see there are different, um, there, there are kind of different cultures within Bitcoin, I would say. And I do think one side of the sort of Bitcoin culture they're a bit more marketing focused maybe and, and they do sort of have that narrative and they will you know promote bitcoin in that way as it's this undefeatable like perfect system and it can't be stopped and and it, there there's nothing that can go wrong possibly however i do think that there's also especially a more technical minded part of the community so if you speak to actual developers, the people that are actually writing the code to get, to keep Bitcoin up to date and to develop the protocol, in general, these guys, they're mostly guys, but well, 
there are some girls. These people, yeah. they do really take the risks and the threats and the potential failure scenarios very seriously. And they have a very meticulous approach to developing it. So I, I don't think I would say the people that matter the most, they, they don't necessarily think of Bitcoin as, oh, nothing can go wrong. It's it's just completely solved. And this is, uh, you know, the, the future for sure. So, thing, no, they yeah. take they take the potential problem seriously and try to actually fix it and solve it. And because Bitcoin is, of course, a free and source, a free and open source project, it can be improved and it can be fixed. And anyone who has the skills to study the code can look for, you know, what are some potential weaknesses here? What are some potential ways that the system can, you know, be exploited? And and that's actually how the system becomes stronger and stronger because that's how the problems get fixed over time. So it's, it is a pretty robust system now over over time. And it's, you know, it's it's still going strong after 15 years that's now. Pretty, pretty important uh I like the way you categorize that and kind of segment that there's segments that are more marketing oriented and, and uh, ad, they advocate it for the sake of advocating it. Um, let's talk about that prehistory. One of the things that's slightly ironic is uh, the idea that of transparency, we have this open ledger. Uh, it's, you know, spread It's decentralized and spread throughout the world on, you know, all types of different, you know, computers. Um, and yet at the same time, there's a mystery to it. And I think that's one of the appeals why people should read this book because there's a slight, it's not a heavy irony, but it's like, uh, you know, if you uh, if you look at Bitcoin and it's, it's benefit of transparency and it's benefit of an open ledger and everything's triple million, quadruple zillion checked and double checked and rechecked, and yet it's shrouded in mystery uh, in terms of who and when. And, you know, we always talk about these people or him when you talk about uh, Nakamoto, you know, there's there's mystery. Could you just address that as you researched the book and and uh, wrote about the prehistory? Yeah, well, so one of the main goals of sort of this movement, this digital cash movement, so I'm talking about pre-Bitcoin essentially, yeah. was to create digital cash. And what they mostly meant by digital cash was to create something that can be used anonymously on the internet in the same way that paper cash can be used anonymous, anonymously in real life. So that's one part of one leg of that sort of movement. The other leg we just sort of briefly mentioned maybe are more the you know reinventing money uh, kind of gold, digital gold kind of um, type of people. But then yeah. there's yeah, there's definitely also this lack that wanted to create digital cash. Now, whether that was completely achieved with Bitcoin, you know, it's a work in progress, I would say, because like you mentioned, the way Bitcoin works is that everything is completely transparent. Now, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone uses their real name. In fact, Bitcoin itself uses only public keys. So if that yeah. public key cannot be attached to your real identity, then you're using it anonymously. Now, there are ways to de-anonymize that. This is sort of currently a, uh, you know, um, a web, an arms race of, you know, yeah. developers trying to make it more anonymous and then analytics companies trying to figure it out anyway. So that's ongoing. As far as Satoshi himself being anonymous, almost certainly, it's almost certainly a pseudonym, right? I yeah. think that's actually very important for Bitcoin uh, that he was anonymous and that he left. And the reason for that is because Bitcoin is a truly decentralized system. No one is in charge of it. And that's, for example, how you know that no one can come in and say, all right, you know what, these 21 million limits, yeah. let's make it 22 million. Let's in right. introduce a little bit of inflation. Like if someone is in charge of the system, they can make the decision. And because no one is in charge and even the founder is anonymous and left, like he's missing in action. Yeah. He hasn't been around in over 10 years now. I think that does make the system truly decentralized and therefore also very hard to change, especially in bad ways. So no one's going to change the 21 million limit because no one has that authority. It, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the technology of blockchain, which I think is as important as an education journey as, as cryptocurrencies themselves. Uh, blockchain technology is not... Uh, 
was was pre Bitcoin by for sure. That's part of that prehistory, and to to use this, I'm so surprised that blockchain is not used more prevalently in other areas of our lives. Uh, for example, the, the one that comes to mind, uh, my first to my head, uh, is is elections. You know, the idea that that you could uh, and, and that's a threat to, I guess, some people in power, depending on what country you're in. There's, there's uh, uh, you know, countries that are less stable, perhaps, or, you know, have a higher degree of corruption uh, than others. Uh, I would just think that people would absolutely demand that. But then again, it's it's very difficult to, uh, you know, monitor the those things, you know, to make sure those are all right, if you, unless you're a computer expert, I suppose. But why do you think it is that blockchain, um, or maybe I'm wrong and it has grown more, uh, but 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 could you talk about blockchain in terms of, uh, you know, uh, I think DeFi is an awesome idea. I think it's a huge idea. I think it's a hard thing to do. And we'll talk about the political implications of that. But what about blockchain just for DeFi? What about blockchain for elections and things like that? What's the future? Yeah, well, blockchain over the years has become a bit of a buzzword. So it's not entirely clear what people exactly mean when they use that word. People tend to mean different things. But I do explore in my book the history of blockchain, essentially. I, as far as I know, Satoshi was the first, or Bitcoin was the first to actually call it blockchain. But the concept itself uh, dates it's back or stamps. Yeah, existed like in a, as time stamping. So... If you wanted to know for sure that a digital document wasn't forged after the fact, then there were timestamping solutions where basically digital documents were cryptographically linked to each other. And therefore, the order cannot be changed because that's how cryptography essentially works. Like you can't yeah. just remove one document because then everything like the math would change for every document that follows. So you can't remove anything. So this was a this was a relatively old idea that was introduced in the 90s and then Satoshi kind of used that idea in Bitcoin as a way to keep track of which transactions predated which other transactions and you can't change the transaction record. Now interestingly you mentioned elections and actually in the last year in Guatemala they have been starting to use the Bitcoin blockchain itself to uh, timestamp the election results in the Bitcoin blockchain. So you cannot tamper with the election results. Now, I don't know the exact details of how they did it or how they sort of uh, translate the paper election bills to the to the digital. Yeah. I don't know the details, but the idea of implementing data in such a way that it cannot be changed in the future is very interesting and and bitcoin yeah uses that as well and enables that for potential other use cases elections could be one of them it, it's it is such an opportunity and i want to give the name of the book again it's uh the genesis book the story of the people and projects that inspired bitcoin uh the website is the genesisbook.com you can go there and and uh, check that out I mentioned that uh, this is a great, uh, it's been, in my experience, a wonderful gateway drug for people to financial education. And maybe we'll share a little bit of that concept of why I think that's true. For example, when I meet what we might call a brand new person who's not an investor, a, a lay person, maybe you'd say, a worker bee, and they say, I want to get rich. You know, that's a, that's a very broad concept. You know, there's a lot of different things. When you look at a financial statement, you know, assets, liabilities, income, expenses, uh, statements of cash flow, those three components of financial statement, you can understand that that not all assets behave the same. And when I look at Bitcoin, a lot of people think about investing as a capital gain venture. In other words, I'm going to uh, buy this thing and the value of this thing is going to go up high and I'm going to sell this thing and I'm going to be rich or at least I'm going to hold this thing. Well, then I have to sell it in some way. To, you know, if I'm going to turn into food, clothing, shelter, medicine, I got to have an exchange at the height. Said nobody, I think, I want to buy this golden goose 
that lays golden eggs because I think next week the price of the goose might be higher. Uh, a person that thinks about a golden goose thinks about the production, a machine, a mechanism. We have a little cash flow jack in the box up here that you do some work, there's a machine, and boom, out comes a, a golden egg. So Bitcoin, and then a third idea, uh, I have, for example, some physical gold. And the reason I have that physical gold is not because I think I'm going to buy it low and sell it high. Not because I think I'm going to open up a safe and have it multiply overnight. So, wow, look, new, new gold. It's a hedge that says, well, if a, if a, you know, the dollar seems to be dropping and there's lots of reasons for that as we print more and as it becomes, you know, more abundant. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a 21 million, you know, stop on the abundance. There's a scarcity to Bitcoin. There's not a scarcity of fiat currency that's inherent. It's declared. And as you learn these things, you have something called a hedge. So my attraction to Bitcoin was not to get rich off it. It was not to believe that it could cash flow for me and produce new income. My approach was, well, this if I lived in Argentina and my, you know, my currency of my country was all over the place, you know, Bitcoin's all over the place too, but it's another place I could go to put my put a, a store of wealth. Could you speak about those facets and and uh, you know what's the purpose of Bitcoin? I, I when I first heard about, it, I thought, well, this would be a new way to buy a pizza. Uh, this is just going to be a new way to you know spend money. It's a it's a new way to you know a medium exchange. So the idea of a capital gain investment, a cash flow investment, a store of wealth, a medium exchange, a hedge, all of these things start to come together for a person. That's why I think this is a gate, great gateway drug for financial education. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I think I ultimately it's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question, but I'll I'll see how far I get. Yeah, the ultimate goal of Bitcoin, I would say. Well, I already mentioned there were sort of two goals. One group of people is mostly interested in the anonymous futures of it. Yeah. And but then there was also this group of people that were more the monetary reformers. So they were interested in creating a better form of money. This yeah. idea is to a very large extent uh, come from Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian economist. And he believed that money should be left to the free market. Yeah. So just let the free market decide want, what it wants to use as money. We don't need the government to impose that. It can just be private companies or banks or you know whoever wants to issue it. And then people will decide what to use. So I think this is sort of the big idea here for Bitcoin there. Now, it does share a lot of aspects with gold. You already mentioned some of them. Uh, scarcity is a big one of course um, and the way I kind of see it is I, when you talk about hedging gold I would sort of interpret that as what is the possibility that fiat currency like the dollar would actually fail and the world moves back to gold like that's you know maybe it's a 1% possibility maybe it's some people would say it's 90 like whatever it is I would say that's ultimately sort of the bet you're making if you're hedging with gold is that the world will move back to the gold standard eventually. And I would say Bitcoin is kind of the opposite. It's kind of just like saying fiat currencies will fail, but we're not going to move back. We're going to move forward. We're going to move to this newer, better technology that has all these similar attributes as, attributes as gold, but now you can use it over the internet and it's much faster and it's easier to store and it has these other properties that are better suited for the 21st century. So they're in the same category, you could argue, gold and Bitcoin, for me anyways, but gold sort of represents the past and past. Bitcoin represents the future. You know, there, there are dogmatists, uh, gold, what I might call a gold bug. My grandfather's gold bug, you know, I inherited that from that environment. I'm a bit of a gold bug. You know, I've always got gold and silver hanging around here on my shelf. Uh, but, but the reality is, is, you know, some people say, well, when the, when the dollar was taken off the gold standard, you know, when, when Bretton Woods kind of, when that system came to an end and in 1971, you know, France is wanting all the gold back and it's a problem. And Nixon says, Hey, we're going to pull off the gold standard. They say, well, that's the day that money stopped being money. Uh, but you could look at, you know, all arguments have three sides, heads, tails, and the edge, right? You could also equally say, well, that's the day gold stopped being money. 
because I certainly don't go to the grocery store and use gold. I think it has a lot to do with confidence of people that really anything could be a medium exchange based on the confidence of it. And I think there's a, a feeling with Bitcoin that often happens with, with new investors and, and less savvy investors is there's an anxiety and a fear that there's something big happening and I might miss out. You know, if I don't act on this, I get rich. My approach is maybe less opportunistic. And I say, well, look, if I own, uh, you know, I'm Warren Buffett and I own massive amounts of shares in the Coca-Cola company. Well, if people decide they want to pay me in gold and that's what everyone has confidence in, that's fine, but they're still going to have to trade that stuff to get their Coca-Cola. And if they want to pay me in Bitcoin, that's fine. If they want to pay me, in, you know, I really don't care what the medium exchange is. I'll take whatever people have confidence in. I really don't care. But but money has changed. We used to use feathers. And we used to use seashells. And we used to use gold. And we used to use fiat. So I, I don't see a problem with changing what we have our confidence in if we see something that gives us more confidence uh, for a reason. Uh, I think decentralization has its benefits and its risks. Uh, I think anonymity has its benefits and its risks. Um, and as soon as I can find a person who is able to talk about risks and poke holes in Bitcoin, then I feel like I have someone that can teach me about it. Because I don't poke holes in the stock market to say, oh, you shouldn't invest in stocks. I poke holes in the stock market to say, if you're going to play this game, there's hurdles and pitfalls. You manage those risks, and, and it's an educational journey that makes you successful. So can, can, we, can, I, poke, can I throw a few holes at, at Bitcoin here, and you can either say, no, Andy, you're up in oh, the night course. or whatever. So one of the yeah, analogies, sure. one of the analogies I always make uh, when I have this conversation, I hope my listeners don't find this boring because I think it's more interesting to hear people's response to it than the, the response to the question is more interesting than the question. When I was first introduced to the World Wide Web for the very first time, we had a protocol and it's called Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Uh, it was a little behind uh, the SMTP, the email protocols. And uh, I opened up this thing called a browser. It was called Netscape. And that was the internet. I mean, that was it. You got on, I mean, a lot of people when they, oh, I'm going to get on Netscape. I'm going to get on the World Wide Web. I'm going to get on the internet. Those are all different things. But many people just said, Netscape is the internet. Uh, I don't think my kids would even know what that is. <laughs> so that's called obsolescence risk. And when you look at technology in general, in the way that it, the evolution of technology is, is much more rapid than say biological evolution. Technological evolution is breakneck speed. So as soon as you have a, a, a Bitcoin, you know, you're know you gonna have an ETH and you're gonna have 8 zillion of these. Does Bitcoin have obsolescence risk? Is it gonna, are you gonna write a book, on, uh, let's say 10, 15 years from now, and you'll refer to Bitcoin the same way in the crypto world as you would refer to Netscape in the browser world. Is there obsolescent risk, a better blockchain, a better mousetrap that can come by and instantly Bitcoin is like blockbuster video. It's like uh, you know US robotics. It's like the Palm Pilot uh, or any other early technology you want to, you know, Quattro Pro, word perfect, pick your technology. That's the first and the biggest, but then the obsolete. Yeah, well, I, I would give you two answers to that. So my first answer to that is I think it will be very hard for any cryptocurrency to overtake Bitcoin because of what it would do to the confidence in this entire field of technology, essentially. Like one of the big promises of Bitcoin is there will only be 21 million. So if that promise is essentially broken because it's overtaken by another coin that doesn't apply that doesn't adhere to this 21 million then why would anyone trust any of this right so i think it's very hard for bitcoin to be overtaken and then for that reason sort of a game theory reason i would call that and then the other thing is bitcoin is best seen as a protocol so once a protocol has a certain network effect it becomes very difficult for an other protocol to overtake that. 
So the email protocol, for example, SM is still uh, SMPT still there. Yeah, it's still being used. Uh, th there's definitely better ways of doing email now that we know of. Like there's specific ways we could have handled messages that don't arrive or there, there are things we could have done differently in hindsight. But because it's so widely adopted already, no one would switch to a new protocol because if you're switching to a new protocol, you can't email anyone and no one can email you. So there's this very strong network effect for everyone to just keep using the same protocol and this will only grow and grow and this network effect will grow and it becomes harder and harder to overtake. So I think Bitcoin in the same way, it's this protocol for transferring value over the internet and it's becoming harder and harder to overtake that. The, the real innovation, what you're talking about, will probably happen more on the edges and on second layers. So, for example, now we have the Lightning Network, which is a way to make transactions on Bitcoin faster because the transactions are sort of transferred to a layer on top of the main protocol. And now you can send anyone Bitcoin within a second. You don't have to wait for block confirmations. And in the same way, I think we'll see more and more of these second layer and these kinds of technologies, that's where the innovation will continue to build. And again, that only improves the network effect of Bitcoin itself because these layers exist on Bitcoin. Interesting stuff. Um, it seems to be when people find anything that is, uh, they, they always want to build a better mousetrap, right? And let's talk about the energy question. You know, one of the things that many people, I didn't invent this question, uh, it takes a lot of energy. You you have electricity. Gold doesn't require electricity. However, I will tell people that gold costs money to own because if you own a lot of it, you're not keeping it in your house. You got to pay someone to guard it. So there's an expense to even holding gold uh, if you're going to put it in a vault somewhere and you know Brinks or whoever is going to hold this for you. It's literally an expense to hold it. Warren Buffett uh, quipped. Uh, this way it says if you're on Mars you might laugh because you see these humans digging a hole in the ground getting some gold making it shiny moving it to Kentucky digging another hole called Fort Knox putting it back into the ground and paying people to guard it this time uh, if someone were to come you know in related to the question of obsolescence risk if someone were to say hey you know what we have a new technology that is entirely different than blockchain and it requires so much less energy we can easily take the concept of scarcity and duplicate that okay this one has 25 million or you know 10 whatever and frack you know it's you can fractionalize it because bitcoin's certainly fractionalized no one really buys a pizza with one bitcoin um what are the implications there as far as the energy it takes and the expense of actually having it and uh, the dependency of electricity uh, and, and having computers to run this. I mean, there's a huge dependency on that. Thoughts? Yeah, so I'll say two, I'll say two things about that again. So the first thing is, uh, so I mentioned how protocols have this network effect and they become hard to overtake. Now the exception to that rule, you could argue, which you allude to, is if a new protocol is that much better, it's if it's really new generation, like in your example, we figure out how to do blockchain that has the same security as Bitcoin, yeah. but uses none of the yeah. power. One, one like percent of the energy. Huge... Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. right. So what, what I think will happen in that case, I mean, this is just a personal opinion, of course, but I think because Bitcoin is free and open source software, it is code in the end. Bitcoin can be upgraded. So I suspect in that case, Bitcoin will be upgraded to implement this technology. So everyone who's holding Bitcoin, everyone has the incentive that they're not overtaken by some other protocol, of course. So everyone has the incentive to adopt this revolutionary new technology into Bitcoin. And then, you know, you still have that scarcity. It's still Bitcoin. It just has this new technology embedded in it. That's perfectly possible. Certainly. For about sure. the energy question itself, I'll, I'll quickly address that. So one of the interesting things about that is because Bitcoin can be mined everywhere in the world, there, it's location independent. The yep. miners tend to go where electricity is the cheapest. 
and where yeah. is electricity the cheapest is where it's not used anyways so this kind of, this is often uh in in spots where there's like hydro dams and there's no industry yeah. anymore so you know they got hydro dam might as well mine bitcoin and there's these kinds of spots so i don't think the narrative that bitcoin is like wasting energy or doing a lot of environmental no, damage is very true it, it, it it's actually i could riff on this for a while but i'll leave it here <laughs> i think it's uh, actually relatively energy efficient ironically enough i mean compared to how much energy banks are using and anything else really and bitcoin at least has this property that it goes to where energy is the cheapest yeah i think people say it wastes energy well shoot the tv is it, i'd say it consumes energy i mean watching my tv is that a waste of energy or a consumption of it right uh let's talk a right. little bit about um central central banking so here's an interesting pushback is if i'm the federal reserve and i see you know my whole deal is control right i've got to control this money supply and policy you know you know i want to have policy to try to manipulate this stuff raising interest rates expanding the money supply contracting it bearishness or excuse me uh dovishness hawkishness what have you um so now we talk about digital currency from a federal reserve perspective or a central bank perspective where they say, hmm, you know, this is really a really competitive ours, this idea that it's decentralized. I'm kind of a libertarian minded guy where I'm a pretty big fan of decentralized currency, but I'm also not dogmatic about that, that I understand there's a pragmatism to when the cat's away, the mice will play. You give anonymity to people, you're going to have massive corruption. So if we have time, we'll we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how that, how, you know, we'll talk about Sam Bankman, Freed, and we'll maybe get to that. But the idea that that you could compete with, with crypto with a digital currency that's from a state, you know, like a dollar, we, we create a, a digital dollar. The idea that you could track, I mean, think of the tax revenue they could pick up now from all these guys that do things under the table. You know, you would eliminate a ton of fraud. Um, politically, Bitcoin, if you say it's illegal, now a person, you know, if you declare it illegal as a country, you, instead of Guatemala who embraces it, you have a country that says, if we find you doing Bitcoin transactions, you're gonna go to prison or whatever, you're gonna be fined. How does that work? I mean, now I have to make a conscious decision as a citizen to break the law and to say, well, I trust the anonymity that I won't get caught. Talk about that dilemma for a citizen. If uh, if a, if they say, no, you're going to use a digital dollar, you're going to pay taxes in a digital dollar. We don't accept anything other than that digital dollar for your taxes. How does that work politically? Yeah, well, one part of the answer is that, as you already suggested, Bitcoin is kind of designed so that you can use it even if you're not allowed to, even if it's illegal, because it's this completely decentralized decentralized protocol. So in the same way, the analogy would be BitTorrent, which allows people to, you know, download music or movies illegally. It's illegal. But still, many, many people do it because it's so incredibly hard to stop. It's, you know, how are you going to stop millions of people downloading this on their own computers Napster. in their own living room? Yeah. Right. Well, Napster was centralized. So then that technology yeah. evolved over the years to become BitTorrent. And now it's right. essentially unstoppable. Right. So Bitcoin is designed in that same way that you it, it's basically an unstoppable protocol. You can't, as a government, say there's no Bitcoin in our country anymore. What you can do, of course, as a government is to ban the use of it, make it illegal. And then if you catch someone, throw them in jail. That's possible. You can yeah. still make things illegal. Um, my opinion is that I still believe in democracy reasonably well, reasonably enough. <laughs> and I think being able to make transactions privately should be legal that's a human right privacy in general is a human right that's something we should be allowed to do and i think that's a right we shouldn't give up so easily i think we 
at least in the free Western world, should have the right to make private transactions. So that includes Bitcoin transactions. However, this will probably be a big political battle over the next... It's already started, but it oh, will yeah. probably continue, continue to be a big battle over the you know, next 5, 10, 20 years. Who knows? Uh, but as an analogy, in my book, actually, I also write about the crypto wars. So the crypto wars, this was an event in the 90s where the American government tried to limit the use of cryptography itself. And this also became a political battle as well as activists like the cypherpunks who are sort of the yeah. founding fathers yeah, of, had... the, of the Bitcoin. Yeah, I had that. Yeah, as so, so they start to... Okay, the, the yeah. cyber, so they start the to push back against these new regulations. And well, we might see something like that today with Bitcoin and private transactions. I, and I by, actually... So they, they won that battle back then. That's, the that's cyber... why today we have cryptography on our phones. The cyberpunk movement is a big part of this. When people read when people read your book, that's an interesting thing. We talked about confidence. Confidence come, often comes out of movements, and that's an interesting part. You know, when you read the the Genesis book, everyone, the cyberpunk uh, component of this is an interesting part of this story and this narrative that gives this thing energy and gives this thing legs. Uh, let's talk about this when you. When, when a person invests in stocks, generally you don't want money in a savings account because savings accounts are really monies that often a bank will take and turn into real estate loans. And they're really not designed to be touched very often. When people say, I'm going to save money, the bank would like you to keep that money there really indefinitely. They're, they're not excited about a guy withdrawing and depositing every day. So another place to put that is called a money market. And money markets generally, you know, they 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 have to preserve. It's called breaking the buck. They have to preserve your dollar. So if I put a dollar in a money market account and I wake up the next morning it fluctuates down to ninety nine point nine cents, I'm freaking out right there because I need to have total confidence in the stability of that money market. So they invest in things like, uh, you know, they invest in things like government bonds. They're you know, theoretically risk-free. That's a whole nother discussion. They invest in, uh, you know, the re reverse repo market and things like that. So as a trader, if I want to buy a stock, I'm going to have this tank of money, you know, this, this, this money market to which to draw from. And if I want to sell a stock, I need a place for that money to come to. So with Bitcoin, people that trade it, they really needed something like a, that was akin to a money market. And so we come up with this thing called Tether. And to me, this is fascinating because Tether, in my mind, very much acts like a money market account. Tether to the crypto investor trader is as a money market is much to the stock and options investor, I think. So here on the one side, you have this incredible transparency. You have this open ledger. You have, you know, this uh, this blockchain technology. On the other side, you have Tether that is centralized, totally, that has had its problems and its investigations. And it's, uh, quite frankly, they've been caught with their pants down more than once and fined. We know we have people running Tether that have broken the laws or at least had to settle with governments. And if the Tether were to fall... I, I just know if if the money market broke the buck, the stock market is in huge trouble. If Tether breaks the buck, uh, crypto is in massive danger. Could you speak to the irony of Tether being totally centralized to support something that's decentralized? Well, I don't know if I agree with your premise. I, I don't know if Bitcoin would be in trouble if Tether would fail. Maybe some other cryptos would be that are more more reliant on the Tether as sort of the, the currency to trade it against on these more niche exchanges. Interesting. But I think Bitcoin itself is, you know, big and has a lot of trading volume also against, you know, any other currency, dollars, euros. So I'm personally not too convinced that 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 would affect Bitcoin too much. Interesting. The other thing to say about Tether, so I'm not going to defend, endorse, or anything like that about Tether because I just don't know. And you you said it well, they're centralized and you're basically yeah. just trusting this company. What I will say about Tether is 
you can short it. So if you're shorted, there's yeah. basically <laughs> no risk, right? It's not going to go up. It's not going to be wor worth more than a dollar. Yeah. It could go down. And even <laughs> though you can short it, it's still trading at around a dollar, which yeah. means that someone has a lot of confidence in it. So if someone has a lot of confidence in it, it sort of suggests to me that maybe insiders have a lot of confidence in it. Otherwise, who else would have that much confidence in it? But that's I, at, at this point, I'm just thinking out loud. Again, I'm not endorsing yeah. Tether. I'm not defending yeah. it. That's all I'm sort of noticing, and I find it interesting at least. But I, I don't hold Tether, and I wouldn't recommend it. Interesting stuff. By the way, I love it when people disagree with me because I hate being in an echo chamber. So when someone that's studied it more than I have says, Andy, I disagree with your premise, I think, okay, I got to reevaluate my premise. <laughs> um, but, could you talk... Talk, touch on Sam Bankman Freed, if you would. Your thoughts just on well, that. This, whole... is, this is very outside of my scope of uh, of the book or of, of anything I covered in, in my own writing. But I guess the short version, I the reason I was never particularly interested in it is that what Bitcoin for me represents, or at least a big part of it, is that you can own your own money. So it's be your own bank, right? That's that's the yeah. saying we have in the Bitcoin yeah. world. And, you know, if you trust your Bitcoin to a new type of bank, whether that's uh, Sam Bankman Freed's exchange or any <laughs> other exchange, or you're, you're back to trusting companies and Bitcoin is designed not to have to do that. Um, so, you know, I, I think if people want to do that, it's at your own risk and this is what can happen. So I, I would recommend everyone to hold uh. their own keys and hold your own coins coins well i'll throw this out to to people there is an interconnectivity with bitcoin and the dependence that's really nice for example i'm a big fan of bitcoin for this reason uh, i have one of the largest positions i have in stocks is apple so i'm the biggest fan bitcoin ever had whether it goes up or down i don't care but you're going to look at your phone uh, to see i own at&t and if you want to make some transactions through your phone, you're going to use my network. Uh, you know, so I'm the biggest fan of Bitcoin ever had because the bigger it gets, the more dependent you become on my iPhones that I sell, the more dependent you're becoming on my AT&T. And really, you know, I, I've in, I haven't invested in Coinbase as much as I've traded it, but I've enjoyed Coinbase at times as an options trader to enjoy those premiums that come whether it goes up or down or not. And I, I love the idea of being an entrepreneur because at the end of the day, people want food, clothing, shelter, medicine, plastic, carpeting, uh, you know, paint, housing. And if they want to pay me, if I produce those things, they want to pay me in Bitcoin, I'm fine with that. I think one of the best ways to make money is to go produce value for people and whatever people have confidence in, I'm fine in taking that. So I, I shied away from the idea that someone's going to become a, a Bitcoin billionaire. When I bought uh, Bitcoin the first time, it was probably around 300 bucks a coin. And I was just experimenting. with. I just thought, I want to know what this is, so I'll buy one. And then I forgot about it. <laughs> and then one day there was a new story that it hit 10,000. I told my wife, I go, I think I have some of this. And I, I'd, I'd opened up so many wallets trying to figure it out. I had to go back and it was quite a chore to find which wallet actually worked to, to get to it. I've traded options on it. Um, the options market in Bitcoin has been a great gateway drug because people that have hated options and just the idea of, of stocks and options, I've said, well, let me show you something here. You can actually get paid to buy your Bitcoin. If you sell a put and say, I'm willing to buy Bitcoin, say at 30,000. Uh, and it drops down to 30, you can actually get paid to keep that promise. And people are like, what? I can get paid to buy my Bitcoin. So I did a whole course, uh, the Cashflow Academy on options. But what people find is it's still thinly traded. The spreads are kind of wide. Uh, it, it's a tough way to do it compared to what you can do in stock market. So I'm a big fan. You know, I've traded it. I've owned it. And I, I kind of told people this. I go, well, if there's only 21 million of them, there's more than 21 million millionaires out there. And if you buy one, someday you might have something that not, not all millionaires can even afford or that they can all have. So from that standpoint, I'm like, hey, you know, have some fun, you know, buy one, see what happens. So 
uh final thoughts or, on or buy book. a fraction of course yeah, yeah you or, can buy a fraction yeah. which people sometimes forget it's fungible right you can cut but it the, be the best way to do it as you mentioned is to buy some and then just forget about it for a while yeah and see what until happens you, until you hear about it on the news yeah. one day <laughs> like anything else it doesn't produce anything i think it's great i i i recommend Everyone, I'm an education advocate more than a Bitcoin advocate or or even a detractor from or a critic of it. I know I ask hard questions about it. I, I can do the same thing with stocks, real estate, oil, because I'm fans of all this stuff. You want to buy assets uh, in your life. So go out and get the Genesis book, the, the story of the people and the project that inspired Bitcoin. And you'll have a wealth of information. Yeah, hold it up. You'll have a wealth of information. Uh, from a guy who has really been in the front lines of this and written about it, probably as much as anyone on the planet has studied it and written about it. And uh, you guys always know how I sell books, those that listen to me. I say, look, if you had a chance to sit down with Aaron at dinner and, and pick his brain for an hour, would you be willing to pick up the check? Because for much less of an investment, you can get much more of an hour of his thoughts by picking up the Genesis book, the story of the people pro and projects inspired bitcoin his website is the genesisbook.com any final thoughts on uh on the book the topic why people should read it before uh before we close um well just what i mentioned i i believe that the best way to understand many topics is to understand where it came from understand the yeah. history understand where these ideas came from what how the people that were working on this stuff what were they trying to achieve and so yes i think today if you're puzzled about this whole bitcoin thing if you want to understand bitcoin a good way hopefully is to you know under study the history as i've explained it in my book you've been so gracious with your time the hours pass so quickly i'd love to spend many more with you would you be willing to come back someday when there's big news in bitcoin of course Fantastic stuff. Hang on just a bit after I close the show so I can properly thank you. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy doc, or excuse me, the Cashflow Academy show podcast. Go to uh, yourinvestingclass.com to learn more about what we do. Go to Amazon and pick up the Genesis book uh, and learn more about crypto. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. It was food for thought. And I hope that Bitcoin becomes a massive gateway drug for you in terms of your financial education. Uh, as you read Aaron's book. We'll see you next time, everyone.